Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal Author Series. And I am super happy to have Alejandro Benitez Lambes and Julio Navarro with us today. Hello, Alejandro and Julio. Hello, Frank. Hello, Frank. Good to see, good to see you. Now, it's great to see both of you. Uh, on this October 17th of 2023, as we record this, we are coming into fall in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, and Alejandro, where are you located at? What's your geolocation? Well, at the moment, I'm located in the Temple of Speed, Monza. Uh, but um, I work on the University of Milano Bicocca in, in Milano, so at the north, in the north of Milano. Um, cool. So basically, that's it. Mm -hmm. And Julio, where, where's your geolocation these days? <laughs> Well, I'm a professor at the University of Victoria in British Columbia in Canada, but today actually in Madrid. So right. in Spain. Yep. All right. Very good. So we got the we got the European one going. Uh, and how is fall going uh, over there? Are we starting to change temperatures, change colors a little bit? Well, it started yesterday. So yesterday the temperature has changed dramatically. So we wow. are 14 cool. degrees maximum. No. I wish I could say the same thing. So I'm here in Phoenix, and we actually heated up by about 10 degrees yesterday. <laughs> so, so we are still in the uh, triple, dig triple digit Fahrenheit um, uh, here in Phoenix in October. So I give it about another two weeks, and then we'll start to, to cool down uh, as we right. come into the, to the lovely winter in Phoenix. So very cool. And Alejandro, what do you like to do for research? Well, for research, uh, I'm currently a Marie Curie Research Fellow, so working here in Milano. Um, cool. my, the, main, the main topic of my research uh, concerns numerical simulations, uh, cosmological and hydronomical simulations, so galaxy formation. And I'm particularly focused on small scale structures, so how the small galaxies and, and studying the edge of galaxy formation, so the, the, essentially the, the mass scale where galaxies, uh, some galaxies form, some galaxies don't form. So basically, I'm studying this. Uh, um, topic uh, actively and part of the paper we are going to talk about today is highly related to that yep cool and julio what do you like to do for research well i've been interested in many things over my career um but i guess if there's one unifying theme or subject it would be to try to put together you know theoretical physics or fundamental physics and astronomy and dark matter which is kind of my passion has always been my passion is is a you know, one subject where we can bring them both together. It is, you know, a topic where, unfortunately, or fortunately, the only observations that we have is astrophysical or astronomical. So far. But the interest from the physicist is, is enormous. So figuring out what is the nature of dark matter and how we can learn from it is, uh, I guess, the main, the main goal of my career. Very cool. Very cool. And that is going to bring us to this very awesome... APJ article. It is open access. We are in the open access era, people. You can go grab a copy for free. Go get one. Is a recently discovered H1 cloud near M94 a starless dark matter halo? Alejandro and Julio, take us away. Well, this is a this is a very short paper that actually we did with Julio just very recently. And, and the idea of the paper or what our goal, at least when, when we wrote this paper, was to try to assess whether a recent a detection of extended emission in 21 centimeters located very close to, to a bright galaxy, which is called M94. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a beautiful spiral galaxy, very close to us, so five megaparsecs away from us. It's actually consistent with some theoretical prediction that Julio and I actually have made a few years ago um, about um, the properties of starless star matter halos. Okay. Um, what is particularly interesting of this object is uh, uh, so the, 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 the detection was done with the uh, 500 meters uh, spherical tele oh. aperture telescope in, in China, uh -huh. uh, which is one of the biggest telescopes on Earth. Um, yes. And the mission is, is has particular uh, very interesting properties, namely the, the, the mission patterns uh, seems to be consistent with the, with the object that is spherical. Uh, and it's, a, it's an object that, uh, that is receding from us at a given speed, 300 kilometers per second, roughly. Okay. Um, it has the, the, the line broadening of the, of the line, uh, of, the, of the 21 centimeter line in radio is consistent with um, a gas 
supported by 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 its temperature, right? So by thermal broadening, so that that means that the the gas doesn't seem to be moving really really fast inside inside the halo, and also most importantly that uh, in the deepest um, astronomical surface in, in the optical we don't seem to see a, a bright galaxy or yeah. or, or even a, a faint galaxy located at at, at that location. Mm -hmm. uh, these are exactly the properties that we predicted of right. starless dark halos back in 2017, I think. So that, that's where the, the first paper of this series uh, uh, appeared. Uh, so when we saw this, when a particular eye, when I saw this, uh, I, I became really, really excited and I couldn't wait to, to start working on this on this paper and trying to assess not only whether qualitatively this uh, emission was actually consistent with what we predicted, but also quantitatively whether this this was the case. And the idea of this paper was to to do this uh, quantitatively, right, and try to assess whether this is really consistent or not with the with the predictions. Cool. Very cool. Okay. Yeah, I think you know to give a bit um, further context to Alejandro was saying, uh, we come to this from the perspective of a you know a dominant paradigm in cosmology. Uh, which we call it lambda cold dark matter, mm -hmm. and that uh, paradigm, you know, predicts the existence of thousands, hundreds of thousands of very very small dark matter halos, and and some of those or many of those actually shouldn't have any stars. And the prediction that we made with Alejandro a few years ago was trying to bridge the gap. So there are so many more dark matter halos than galaxies. The sun dark matter halos cannot have galaxies. Mm. And the transition mm. between okay. halos that have galaxies and halos that don't have galaxies must occur at a relatively high, high mass. <clears throat> halos that don't have galaxies are filled with gas, though. It's just the gas never gets dense enough to form stars. But it could be dense enough to emit in H1, for example. And that's where the prediction comes from. So I think... You know, if this is really confirmed as one of those objects we predicted, we call them relics, uh, for you know, so have some kind of a fancy name. Um, the of limited H one clouds. <laughs> yeah, the initialization limited H one clouds. You have basically clouds of H one that are yeah. basically inhabiting uh, dark matter halos, and we could actually we're, we're able to work out the masses of these halos and make a prediction. If you actually find these relics, they should have a halo of a particular mass. And they also, and the H1 cloud should have a particular size as well. Okay. And those well, predictions seem to be quite consistent with uh, with this particular object. Nice, nice. Onwards. Uh, um, well, what what is interesting about the, this uh, this model is that uh, uh, now we have a. Um, with, with, the, with the properties that with the, with the um, work that we did with Julio, now now we have a, a robust model uh, to predict what are the properties of this object. Right? This is what, what Julio was saying, and and there's out that for for a long time. So the the, the first time we saw this object was uh, wearing uh, was in cosmological simulations, right? So we were studying uh, some side project, and actually we started identifying these gas clouds. I remember. Um, and at the beginning, we didn't know whether these gas clouds were the properties were physical and physical. So we struggled a, a bit with Julio trying to figure out where, where, where were the properties. Um, uh, we came up with a model actually that actually uh, that show us that actually the simulation results were correct. And at the same time, that model uh, allowed us to come up with a with a com complete framework that to teach us how to do the calculation. Is not, not not only to 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 check that the results of the simulation were correct, but also to predict the properties of these objects in detail. Yep. And and given that most of the um, most of the properties of the collapsed halos in lambda CM are, are today well understood, if we apply if we apply that into with, with the with the theoretical framework that we de develop, then that allows us automatically to predict all the properties of these of these objects in 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 with exquisite detail. Cool. Um, Very nice. And basically, the idea is that the the gas in these objects is uh, is basically locked inside the halos and stays in hydrostatic equilibrium with the dark halos, okay. and and the, the pressure is basically sourced by the by the external UV background, 
right? So as, as the universe, as, as the galaxies and the stars form in the universe, they start to emit radiation and the radiation basically uh, start to photo ionize all the universe. Uh -huh. um, and that happens from very early on, right? So from the epoch of cosmic organization that happens at very high redshift. Uh -huh. And most of the gas in the universe is still illuminated by, by this collective radiation background that, that comes from, from all the luminous sources. Um, uh -huh. And it turns out that you can you can actually understand the what determines the pressure of the interacting medium very well by uh, assuming some ionizing background, and this gives you the, the pressure for the for these systems and mm -hmm. and that plus plus the gravity that I mean, that, that that of the gravity of the of the halo that is is, is a well known. Uh, uh, we, we we know very well how to calculate the the gravitational acceleration of these halos. Then we we can derive out very well the the, the density profile of, of these objects. Um, and this is essentially what allows us to do this type of comparison and produce the models that, that we're going to see in, in this paper, right? So these are analytic models that yep. have been cross-checked with cosmological simulations uh -huh. of, of galaxy formation. Very nice. Very nice. Um, okay. Yeah, I guess one of the critical things about this is the fact that, so as I said before, cold dark matter predicts many, many dark matter halos that shouldn't have galaxies. But none of them have yet been convincingly detected. Right. And, uh, so, if that is true, I mean, there have been hints, especially from gravitational lensing, uh, mm -hmm. distortions, you know, of giant arcs, that those things may exist, but this is all been hints. And often when people find those things, they also find a galaxy associated with it. So, if, if this is confirmed, this will be the first, you know, yeah. cold up matter halo, if you want, that doesn't have a galaxy. In it, yeah. from that point of view, it has you know I think uh, fairly important you know cosmological significance. Mm -hmm. Physical as well, very cool, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Be you keep um, if if you would like to, I, I mean, it's very easy to to put the, the object in context. If you like to go to figure one uh, to the to the video, uh, flow. sure, people, we're going to show a couple of videos just to set the stage here a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and share those videos right. Now you want to start off with uh, the Zeman or relics? that one? Yep, yeah. yeah, the relics, relics, relics. So this is yeah. So this is what we expect, right? So this is a simulation of the formation of the local group, and what you see at the moment are the the stars, and now we are seeing the gas, and this is the dark matter, right? Mm -hmm. So imagine you, and, and now you see the stars again, just to to try to understand the morphology here. So if we zoom in into one of these parallel galaxies, assume this is M ninety four. I mean. For, uh, uh, it's very similar to what we're going to see in the paper. Cool. Uh, you, you see, this is a particularly normal spiral galaxy in, in, in the simulations. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting now when we zoom out to see the distribution of these uh, starless halos that Julio was talking about, right? Okay. So yes. now we are going to put circles, and the circles are going to show what are the locations of these starless Wow. Collapsed dark matter halos. And you see, there are plain, there are many. A lot of them. And once you put the dark matter on, then you see the small blobs there in the center of each circle. And now, if you turn the gas, most of them actually don't have too much gas on, on them, right? So you you see yeah. the circle, but you don't see a clump. But if you increase the contrast and we focus, for example, in one of those, like this tiny halo there that doesn't yeah. have a galaxy associated to it, you see it has some gas. Mm -hmm. and now, if we, if we turn on the the neutral hydrogen for of, for this object, then what you see is that it's a very concentrated core of neutral hydrogen in, in yeah. the center. Yeah. And this is what we believe we have observed now. Got it. Uh, and this is in H alpha. This is a different type of mission. So this is another prediction of the model that the, this object should be observable in H alpha and also in, 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 in 21 centimeters. But but this is a different wavelength. Sure. Um, I mean, this is just to give context, right? So this is what the simulations predict, what, the, what we expect within the Lambda CDN cosmological model. And, um, and based on, on, on the physics that, that are in the simulations, right? And yes. now we can go back to the paper. Um, okay, um, go back to the paper. You want to so and, want... and imagine this, right? So when we see the the observation now. Okay, we will do that. So let's go back to the article. Where am I? Share screen. Sorry, people. <laughs> okay, figure one. <clears throat> figure one. So in figure one, now now it's not simulation. Now this is uh, the observation. So reported by the by by a recent paper also in APJ by by Sue et al. Um, mm -hmm. 
So what you see in the in the top panel is are the uh, 20, the twenty one centimeters isocounter, right? So this is det detected by the radio telescope, and the white line show the the proper isocounters reported by 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 this paper by Sauer et al. Um, what I mean, without without paying attention to the to the red dashed lines, what you see is that the isocounters are are, are fairly uh, circular. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, so that, that that's the reason we are basically approaching them with the circles that you see the, with the dashed lines. So the dashed lines are perfect circles that basically we're going to use to measure the distance of each isocounter to the center, okay. right? So that, so that we can make the plot that you see at the bottom in the in the bottom panel. In the bottom uh -huh. panel, you see exactly that. So the the x-axis is the radius, and the y-axis basically shows the value of the column mm -hmm. density inferred from the ray observations at that location. Okay, a few times to right. the team column depth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um this is this is the way to to quantify uh, what we see in the in the in the top panel, right? Yep. So there are okay. two things to know. One, one important thing to note here is that actually most of this observation is highly uh, limited by the by the beam size of the telescope, which is indicated by the circle that you see at the bottom mm -hmm. left. Ooh. Right. So the beam is essentially uh, it's just mirroring out the, the signal from right. the from, uh, the intrinsic signal coming from that object, right? So in in, what, in some some ways, so basically what it's doing is basically it's the, the signal is convolved with that with that beam and produces the pattern that you see in the in the sky. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what well, we don't we don't we are, it's impossible for us to see the intrinsic flux coming from this object, but we see the flux convolved with this beam, right? Yes. And the fact that the beam is so big compared to the observations implies that the observation is limited by that beam. So yes. what we can say from this observation is very limited, and we need to have this in mind throughout oh, we'll the, the analysis. <laughs> right. We'll so one 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 implication will be that the, this object is highly circular, mostly because the beam. Right. Oh, that's a fair point. Okay. Yes. Right. So mm -hmm. so that that's currently an uncertainty. So we don't know whether this object is intrinsically circular or is largely right. circular because of the beam. Right. right. Mm -hmm. um, if we I think it's a before going to the analysis, now we can go to the to the figure that shows actually this emission uh, relative to M94. So the, the second video. Figure two. Here we no, go. the video, the video. Oh, video. Sorry. My bad. Yep. All good. Doing a little screen share here, but da, 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 da. let's go to the zoom in. And here we go. Maybe we're not. No, I don't see it. Yeah. Hang on. Welcome back. Right. Now, what you see in this video, so is the location of M94, the spiral galaxy I was mentioning before in the top panel, and the and cloud nine at the bottom. And uh, you see the radio isocontours again. There you go. And in the background, you see an image coming from the DSS survey. And now you see the, the now in the background, you see the DESI legacy imaging survey. Right. OK. And um, it's really interesting to see that once you take out the isocontours, actually, you don't see anything located, any any extended source located behind the isocontours. Right? right. So you see mostly, you see galaxies, and you see the saturated star at the, uh, at the bottom, but the uh, extended sources consistent with the faint galaxy, you, you don't see them, right? Interesting. Very cool. Um, Very so that allows us to put some limits on the stellar mm -hmm. mass, on the maximum stellar mass that the galaxy will have at, at the inferred distance of this object. And current estimate is that this if there is a galaxy there that we don't see, then the galaxy has to be smaller by a factor of 100,000 times the mass of the Milky Way. So it has to be a really faint galaxy, really, yeah. really faint galaxy, right? Small one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, uh, well, that, that's it for video. So we can go back to the papers now. All good. Stop share. Um, oh, I got to get a better way to do that. But here we go. Figure two. Right. Uh, so in the in the figure two, what we see is uh, essentially the, the the first comparison. Now, now, now that we have the the isocontours, the column density isocontours, or the column density profile now projecting the sky. Yes. Taken from the observation, which is what shows it, which shows in the in the top panel, so with the, the gray circles with error bars, this shows the same density profile that we saw in the in the in Figure One, right? Yes. So now we can we can we can start constructing modeling models of relics uh, that follow the predictions from Lambda CDM. 
Okay. Um, this is shown by different different colors, from blue to yellow. Okay. So Thank from you. blue to yellow, what we are varying is the mass of the relic. Okay. And we are varying some other parameter, which is called the concentration of the Ramate Hello, which is but but the, the, these two numbers are linked in lambda CDM. So basically, essentially, what we're varying is only the mass. Yes. Uh, this is shown in the in the uh, in the bottom panel and the awesome. uh, that one. So mm. that's the mass and the in the y axis and the concentration in the y axis. Oh. So the predictions for lambda CDMs are basically the, the the median mass concentration relation is the dashed line that you see, the vertical dashed line that you that you see in the in that panel. Yeah. And there's some scatter yeah. that is represented by the dashed line. Okay. But a perfect lambda CDM model but on on average to go be on the on the dashed line, right? So yes. and the and the curves that you see from blue to yellow are indicated by these circles there. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. And they are basically the what is important here is that most of the of the models actually lie in a very an extremely narrow range in, in mass, right? So they occupy only a small yes. portion in, the, in that region. And what you see in the top panel is that by varying the mass only by by a little, produces changes in column density, the central column density that varies order of magnitude. Quite a bit, yeah. In the, in the in the top panel, in the top panel. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is indicating two things. One is that first, that it is possible to find a model that agrees with lambda CDM that reproduces more or less observation, which this is the solid line, the, the blue line that you see in the the, the thick solid line okay. that passes most mostly through observations. Mm -hmm. And the and the second important fact here is that the mass of this object, if the object is indeed a relic. It's extremely well constrained by these observations, because small variation to mass produces order of magnitude variations in column density. Uh, absolutely, yes, I'm with you. All right, I'm with you. So if the, if the object is, a, is is which is consistent with the lambda CM relic, then we know the mass very well, right? From from these yes. observations. Yes, that's 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 something that we learn. The second thing that we learn quantitatively is if you look at the middle panel, is uh, the middle panel shows the intrinsic profiles. So the intrinsic profile are the profile before convolving them with the with the beams oh, of the, the telescope. Beam. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the beam is indicated by the vertical dash uh, dot dash line, right? I'm with you. Uh, yeah. What you what you learn there is that most of the observations are very limited, but are compromised by by the beam, right? In Indeed. the sense that yeah, things that. to the left, I mean, uh, we are convolving them, but we are some, somehow losing the information. Yes. That beam so certainly. most of the profiles are contained within the beam. So. Yes. And the consequence of that is that although the models are all consistent with lambda CDM, then we cannot, with this observation, we cannot exclude systems that are not consistent with lambda CDM. Right. For example, right. look at the at the green and the orange points in the in this figure. Yes. These are points that are completely away from lambda CDM. The intrinsic profile in the middle in the middle panel are different, intrinsically different from lambda CDM models. Got it. But if you look at the top panel after combining them with the beam. They look identical to the best Same. fit model, right? Yes, I'm with you. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. although the so to conclude, then although the observations are consistent with lambda CDM, it's difficult to exclude with these observations uh, competing models, right? Yes, I'm with you. Mm -hmm. um, let's assume, uh, Julio, would you like to add something here? I no, I mean I think that you've uh, you've expressed it quite uh, clearly. I guess the only thing I would say is that um, the, the size of these objects for a given mass, H1 mass, are very, very well constrained. So if you tell me what is the H1 mass, which we actually hmm. I think we know for this cloud because we think it's at a distance of M94 and we have the total H1 flux, so we can, we can turn that into an H1 mass. Yeah. Telling me that in the model, at least they're called like matter, I can tell you right away what is the intrinsic profile. And there is no no fudge factors anymore. It has to have you know size of a few arc minutes. Okay, sorry, maybe less than than, than, than an arc minute. Uh, so a couple of few few kiloparsecs. That's what I meant. And uh, unfortunately, as Alejandro was saying, then because of the beam is so large, then it gets blown up into something that is consistent with things that are either that could be also much smaller. But at the same time, it tells you that if you had higher resolution observations of this object, yes, and tell this right away, right? So if you can, you know, have higher resolution with an interferometer, for example, uh, of you know a factor of five or a factor of ten better, 
in Angle, then you can actually tell uh, these models apart very, very easily. Distinguished. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Very cool. We're going to come back to that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. So this is this is this is beautiful because this is showing that the predictions actually that that the, the object is really quantitatively consistent with, with what we're explaining, right? So we don't know, but I mean, there, there is still a case, right? There is a, still yeah. a strong case for the object to be one of the objects we predicted. Yeah. No. It's now it's let's really assume for now to 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 keep going with the paper. Now what, what we did now is assume it's a it's a relic. Right. So let, yeah. let's let's assume this is relic. Okay. If the system is a relic, so then what, what what we see here is that the profile, the observed the observed profile compared to the relic seems to be a little bit more extended in the outer parts compared mm -hmm. to the model. Okay. If you look at, for example, the three outermost uh, points, yeah. observed points, so they seem to be more extended, right? So yes. they reach the same column density as, as larger radii. Right. So compared to the model. Right. Error bars. They seem to be shift. Right. Yeah, or, or upward, or or or, yeah, or, or they shift uh, to to the right, so you can think about like that. Right? Uh huh. Uh huh. Error bars um, get bigger as you get farther out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's, well, yes, the, the error bars get bigger, so that's but it's difficult to 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 conclude to 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 have the robust conclusions from from what happened with this point. But assume it's a relic, and assume and and yeah. and you see that it's a systematic difference, right? So although the, the error bars are large, they seem to be a systematic difference. Uh -huh. So th that systematic difference is what we explore in the next in the next part of the paper. So the, yeah. the, 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 the difference could arise from basically two two that we explore here, but in, in principle they could come from three different uh, there, there could be three causes for this. So one is that the system is not the distance that we think the system it is. And we can discuss how we know the system so later on if, if you wish. But um, distance, yeah. So one is the distance, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the second the second cause could be that the the dark part halo inside this, this object is not as we think it is, but different, right? So it could be there are competing models that predict that dark matter halos are not as we think in cold dark matter, but uh, are are different. For example, the, the, the density profile of dark matter halos is more extended than we think, right? So then then break that for cold dark matter. There, there are yeah. models that actually produce these type of objects. Um, finally, it could be that the characterization of the beam, the fast beam is 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 wrong, right? So yes. that, 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 that could happen. So we, we are exploring the, we, we are assuming the beam, the characterization of the beam is correct. So what we are, Exploring the next two figures is either the distance or the profile of the dark matter halo. Yeah, so look. if we go to figure two, so let, let, let me tell you about the, the distance, how we know the distance of this object. Well, the the distance of this object, because we don't have stars, right? So the object doesn't have stars. So that makes it very difficult to calculate the distance, to estimate no the distance. No um, so the distance. The, the only way you can estimate the distance for this object is from the Doppler effect, right? From the recessional velocity of the object. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we know the object is uh, is receiving from us at 300 kilometers per second. Okay. So unfortunately, that's very local. <laughs> so you know, once you the object is yeah. receiving from us at <laughs> small speed, then the the problem is that the errors are, are very very big. Mm -hmm. Because uh, small uh, perturbations to the velocity can actually drive huge the errors in, in, to the distance at at, at these small at these uh, small distances. Yeah. Uh -huh. So three hundred kilometers. So the, the argument for the distance can like is like this. So the recessional velocity of this object is roughly three hundred kilometers per second. Okay. Is located at fifty arc minutes away from M ninety four. M ninety four, which is close in the, in, in projection. So yep. M like the the recessional velocity of M94 is also of the order of 300 kilometers per second. Okay. So the fact that the two objects are close in are closely separated in the sky and both have the same recessional velocity velocity is like an invitation to think that they are related, mm -hmm. right? One would think. <laughs> the object cannot be closer than four megaparsecs from us at this with this speed because um we, we, don't, we don't know any object in the local universe with ah. estimated distances okay. that moves that fast at distances smaller than four megaparsecs from us. Right. So that, that sets a lower a lower limit to the distance. Good. And an upper limit to the distance is roughly 10 megaparsecs. And, and that comes from assuming the system is a relic. If you if you really believe the system is a relic, yes. then we know how much H1 mass the system 
the upper limit to the H1 mass that the system can have. So we know that from, from the models. Uh -huh. And because we know the flux that we are receiving from uh, with with the, with fast, we can we can actually measure how much flux we are receiving from the object. Uh -huh. That depends on the distance square. Yes. So so by asking the system to be a relic, by requiring the system to be a relic, then we can estimate okay. what is the maximum distance for the object so that it, it H1 mass doesn't exceed the maximum mass for relics. Yes. Okay. Cool. Uh, okay. That says the upper the upper bound. The upper and the upper bound coming from that uh, from that constraint is 10 megaparsecs. Mm -hmm. So we are roughly sure the object is within four megaparsecs to 10 megaparsecs based on this constraint. If the system is not a relic, the upper limit goes away. We, we cannot constrain it, right? But if the system is a relic, then we can constrain it very, very well. Nice. Yeah. Um, cool. So they, this is this is what we are using. Now we we check whether we ma making the the putting the object farther away that from 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 the location of M ninety four. I mean, say ten megaparsecs uh, yeah. doesn't improve the quality of these fits. So the only thing that can improve the quality of the fit at the at the at the outer, in the outer part is bring the object closer to us. Right. Right. So if you bring the object closer to four megaparsec, the picture doesn't change compared to what we did in figure one. So we're exploring this figure, how much closer you need to bring the system in order to for for the relics to match exactly what the observations are telling us, mm -hmm. and the distance that that, you, that is required is actually five hundred kiloparsec from us. Right. So if you want the system to look as extended as we need to match observations everywhere. So the system should be as close as 500 kiloparsecs from us. Yeah, does we definitely do a better job. Okay. Right, that, that's a better job. So two extras. Okay. Cool. So again, we don't we don't know. So from from the reasons I just gave, so it's very unlikely the system is so close to us. But if it was, then it's it's still possible to find a, a good a lambda CDM relic that matches observations. Okay. That, that that's the point. Yes. Right. Good. Good. Okay. So there's a distance. Mm. And the and the final uh, alternative is the um, the density profile. So the properties of relics can be derived using yeah. the fact that the uh, dark matter halos are well described by the NFW profiles, right? Uh -huh. So and the NFW profile is a is a profile that essentially depends on two parameters and one. So one is the mass of the halo and the other one is the concentration, but the concentration is a function of the mass. So in the end, it's only the mass, and because there is a discrepancy, if you but if you believe in the discrepancy in the outer parts compared to lambda CM halos at the distance of an empty four, then okay. the natural thing to do is to say, okay, what happens if we relax the the assumption that the the halos are described by NFW profile? So mm -hmm. let's try to parameterize them with some other profile, which is, I mean, it's called in this context the generalized NFW. So in which essentially we impose a change in the slope of the dark matter in the center. And the price that we pay is that th these halos have okay. a much more extended uh, density uh -huh. profile, okay. much shallower okay. in the center okay. compared to NFW. Yes. So we are putting a lot of mass in the outer part rather than the inner parts. Correct. Yes. I'm with you now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. And basically, what the, the question we are asking is, OK, how much dark matter we need to move out from, from the center or within which radius in order to to match the observation perfectly, okay. right? And this is yeah. what you see in figure in figure five. So before going to figure, they're related. But if you look at the figure five, mm -hmm. so the the fiducial NSW profile that we use for this work is the dash the the gray dash line. Yes. Okay. Whereas the best solution that we find now is the sol for for matching observations everywhere at the distance of M ninety four is the blue solid the, the blue line. Right? Mm -hmm. And what yeah. what we see here is that if the system, if actually what we are seeing here are departure from from CDM from 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 cold dark matter, uh -huh. actually the, the 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 halos have to depart from predictions on on very large scales, right? Yes. Uh -huh. So you see there is a there is a uh, huge mass deficit on scales of roughly six six kiloparsecs for for these objects. These are these are cores of dark matter that are huge compared to what yes. we can produce in alternative models. Mm, yes. Um, mm -hmm. That's a problem. Okay. So, so if this is confirmed, Discriminant. then yes. this is yeah. this will be a problem not only for CDN, but will be a problem for many alternative models as well. So when mm -hmm. um, that's the point. And I, I, and it, 
Although, I mean, I wouldn't like to put too much um, to, to say this is a, this is a strong conclusion because it's mostly driven by 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 the external points that are the ones with the least signal to noise uh, ratio. But okay. but at least it's this is interesting because it's, this emphasizes the power of this object, right? So if we confirm this object is actually a, a relic. Uh, then we see here the, the power of the object to constrain the, the amount of dark matter and also the distribution of dark matter inside the object, right? Yes. And this, op this will open up a, a window to, to probe the nature of dark matter or, or, or the predictions of, or, of, of cold dark matter on, on, very, on, on scales that have never been explored before. That's true. Very good. Um, cool. Very cool. Right. Um, I think that that's basically it. So... Um, Unless Julio wants to add something here, we, yeah, we could jump to the conclusions. I, like, I can add a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I think there are two things I'd like to add. One is um, we mentioned that the mass of the dark matter halo that hosts this relic is actually quite well determined. And that mass is actually quite high. It's like five times 10 to the nine solar masses or so. Uh -huh. Now, if the threshold between halos that form galaxies and don't form galaxies is at that very high, relatively high halo mass, okay. then it means, for example, that in the vicinity of the Milky Way, there shouldn't be you know, a very large number of satellite galaxies uh, because you know, the, the okay. smallest galaxies form in, the, you know, in, the, in, in, in these halos. And that's a quite an interesting prediction that one can make. For example, Take that if you take that that mass and you believe it's the threshold, then for example, the Milky Way should not have more than a couple of hundred luminous satellites. There you go. Mm -hmm. uh, and then and that is something that can be tested. Yes. You know, future observations now are now that our inventory of you know of uh, Milky Way satellites uh, keeps uh, keeps growing. We are now up to about 60, 65 known satellites. Yes. Uh, is that if you go to a thousand, then Ooh. this particular uh, constraint would not hold. But um, and the other thing I, I point out is that I I still believe that although we now explore these alternative dark matter models, these very large cores in the dark matter, I think there are other reasons to believe that that is perhaps a model that is that is not you know uh, very tenable. Like for example, the central density of dark matter, if you go back to that figure, we have the, the big core, central density of dark matter that you have in this model is about you know, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 6.5 yes. in, uh, in solar masses per kiloparsec cubed. Uh -huh. And I just want to point out that you know, there are many small galaxies that are dominated by dark matter that are much denser than this, yeah. with densities reaching 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9, and actually even one that we discovered very recently up to 10 to the 10 solar masses. Yikes. So, Yikes. so that's, I think, another, another argument to say that perhaps, you know, the, the slight offsets in the outer parts that we're seeing uh, between the predicted relic and the observed profile yes. might uh, very well just due to the fact that, you know, of course, every observation has uncertainties and every prediction has uncertainties. And so we are... Uh, we are there in that in that regime. Cool. Beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful, very nice, very very lovely piece of work. Alejandro and Julio, I want to thank you so much for walking us through your very lovely APJ article. Very nice. Ah, uh, and you went there a couple of times. Um, so let me go ahead and and bear down a little bit on that. Um, so what do you what do you think where do you think we go with this over the next like say two to five years? Uh, you know, are there plans or are there any possibilities of getting something with smaller beam sizes so we're not so convolved with the beam size? Is there other uh, potential targets for looking for dark matter halos, et cetera? And so where do we go with this over the over the next couple of years? Well, I, I have very good, very good news. So okay. not, not every in the next couple of, of years. So I can tell you in the in the next couple of months. Uh, so the um, so we have recently pro prompted by these uh, results. Actually, we we asked for for time to observe this object using VLA. Okay. And uh, yeah. so 
the actually the the lower sensitivity of VLA compared to FAST for these objects makes it very difficult to find them using VLA. But once you have identified them with this type of observation, then it's very very easy now to go and do follow up with with VLA. Smaller beam. Uh, so we just got accepted last Friday the proposal to observe the system in uh, using the D configuration array in, B in VLA, which okay. has which has a beam size much smaller than than this. Very nice. Very cool. um, Congratulations. So hopefully in the few couple, in the in the next few months we are going to be able to rule out the the well or to confirm or or at least to to or well, check at least whether no. the, the the shape of this object is still spherical, whether the system is consistent within in hydrostatic equilibrium. Right. Um. So the next step forward will be to observe the same. If we confirm this. With, with the current configuration, then the next step will be to go to the C configuration in VLA, which is even higher resolution, smaller beam size. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But but we need to go step by step, right? Yeah, one step. Um, Fat beam, medium beam, little beam. Yep, very cool. Right, exactly. Uh, that's that from a radio a radio point of view. A, a perfect instrument mm -hmm. for this would be, for example, Meerkat, right? So the, the beam size of yes. Meerkat is so small that that would be perfect to observe this. Yeah. Unfortunately, for this particular object, is uh, is that uh, the declination is too high for for Mirka, mm. so Mirka cannot cannot see it comfortably. So, are there other um, are there other uh, potential dark matter halos that might be targets besides this one? Well, there there is a. Um, there was a recent detection. So actually, there was a paper that came out in APJ also in back in February. Uh, by the same group that detected this this object, ah. and and actually it's, it's it's very similar to this. Uh, the emission pattern, the properties are are very similar. And uh, there is a there is another proposal to do follow up for this object in, in BLA at the moment. Okay. Uh, but I'm a little bit skeptical about this object because the width of the line is uh, ah. forty kilometers per second. Forty kilometers per second is in the high mass end. Uh, yeah. So and and has some rotation, displays some rotation. So uh, the predi our prediction is that this object shouldn't exhibit uh, rotation and it should be in hydrostatic equilibrium. So with the gas at temperature of the, yeah. of the order of two times the to four, and that gives you a broadening of the of the order of twenty kilometers per second for for, yeah. for the for the emission line. Um, for this particular object, the next phase also is to try to observe them in H alpha. So if you use a, a narrow band filters in, in H alpha, then you would uh, and, and do hundreds of hours of observations of, of, of a single field. So then you will be able to to detect the emission, the emissivity com coming from the outer parts of this object. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and the next phase, well, after, after if, if we confirm with BLA, this is a this is still a promising relic. And uh, also the next step will be to do extremely in the optical, do a deepest, the deepest possible survey around this region just to try to put more constraints to the to the maximum stellar mass yes. uh, of, of a galaxy lo located there. Yes. Um, so yeah. these are the three three avenues at, at the moment. Um wow. from a theoretical perspective. This would bring us in the next couple of years, surely, is to 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 understand more of the, how how galaxies form at the, at the smaller scale, right? So mm -hmm. if we confirm this is a relic or not, so this has implication not only for for dark matter but also for our understanding of how galaxies form, yes. not particularly today, but also how they form in, in very early on, because the idea that the relics exist today is deeply linked to the fact that these halos took some time to assemble their mass. Yes. And they assemble the mass after the universe underwent reionization. Yes. Uh, so the fact that this halo never managed to make a galaxy in them is telling us a lot about how the early galaxy formation proceeded in the universe. Cool. Um, this has a lot of interesting implications, right? So <laughs> that's an understatement. Sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I really look forward to seeing. Uh, this topic move forward on the time scale of a few months, maybe a few years. It'll be very cool to see what you got. Very nice. Very nice. Maybe we'll even do a second one when you get your results out. So very cool. Alejandro, thank you. Thank, you. Julio, thank you so much for talking about your very lovely discovery, or at least your article. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank thank you. you so much. You. And that will do everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.